Hi! You're new here, aren't you? You sure picked a great night to come to Ultimore. But we've got to hurry now, or we might be late for the show. There's been a rumor going around that superstar DJ Hypercubus is in town this week to play a secret show. And everyone who's anyone knows that it will end up being at the Large Intestine, the legendary arts incubator and food hall on the north side of town. So tonight, half the student body of the Mechanic Arts Institute is here, dressed head to toe in this new HD spandex that's all the rage. It's so thin that you can put on several layers and dance all night with no perspiration-related tragedies. And when you layer different tints over each other, you get a completely new color. So multiply 63 base colors by, well, as many layers as you can afford. And imagine how a big Thursday night party in Altimore looks. There aren't two people here wearing the same shade. And if somebody does walk in with a tint uncomfortably close to yours, all you gotta do is go into one of the bathrooms and rearrange the order of your layers. There's about 200 or so kids undulating away inside the club right now. And maybe half that many more crammed into the front sidewalk and around the block, vaping and chatting in the glow of the 52 foot tall LED billboard surmounting the intestines roof. This very corner is the thumping heart of Altimore's Arts District. So the city built this huge LED that showcases the work of local photographers and graphic designers in between the ads. The other side of the billboard looks down on a dim alley, separating the intestine from the body shop next door. The roaring generators that keep the LED sign shining 24 hours a day are in a chain-link enclosure at one end of the alley. Amidst the din, a rebel spirit called Tanya Hardcore pulls up on her Ridley Autoglide. Leaning her chrome steed securely against the enclosure, Tanya takes off her carbon fiber helmet, revealing a fine, angular face <laughs> and one of the most fearlessly aquiline noses of all time. Her makeup is monochromatic, like her clothes, but hardly subdued. She's covered half her head in irregular polygons, disrupting any semblance of symmetry. Everyone else in attendance tonight shows an ensemble in the hopes of showing up in as many photographs as possible. Tanya made sure she wouldn't show up in any. But she's not even out of the alley before her self-oriented fashion statement gets her noticed. Ogled, in fact, by a trio of oogles drinking 40s with a napping pit bull. What up, renegade? Nice war paint. Tanya blows off the chuckling crusties. Nice poverty cosplay, bitch. Ooh. She's on a mission. As she approaches, the variegated swarm in front of the club parts, instinctually assuming that anyone with such an aggressively contrarian cosmetic strategy must be an important performer. Found for the stage. The front doors of the large intestine part in similar fashion, as they do for anybody who approaches during business hours. In a far corner of the club, behind a queue of self-conscious socialites waiting for the bathroom, Tanya uses a telemetry app on her smartwatch to scrape the password off the roof access door and reboot the cameras in the adjoining stairwell. Before the electric eyes are back online, Tanya's already got cool night air on her cool buzz scalp and the padlock off the sign's maintenance panel. The stage is just about set. The most dangerous data infiltrator in all of Altimore is ready to shred. With one fluid motion, Tanya unboxes the brand new 11-inch Claudia Smart Mask with haptic interface fingertip peripherals. It's detected almost immediately by the operating system on her significantly older and creatively bedazzled laptop. No drivers required. She slides on the haptical finger sleeves like a surgeon with an imminent appointment and jacks into the 52-foot billboard's data supply port physically. With just a few twitches of her tattooed phalanges, Tanya plunges the block into darkness. All the vapors raise their faces to the extinguished monolith in unison. There's a pattering on the pavement as several USB pacifiers drop from their owner's gaping mouths. 
High above, Tanya begins to wiggle her fingers again, and the illumination returns tenfold. No longer in the form of delicious beverages or prestigious continuing education programs, but as a nauseating field of asynchronous pixels, each changing color and intensity at a uniquely varying rate. The roar of the science generators prevent Tanya from hearing the satisfying slosh of many semi-digested tapas on the sidewalk below. Tanya's gaze, sealed in the smart mask, tracks unseen streams of incandescent data across the sky. After some more spasmodic hand ballet, the 50-foot screen changes again, and a pillow-like child with baby cow horns appears. As this merciful obstruction begins to address the terrified crowd, the shrieking of those too traumatized to run back into the safety of the club finally abates. All of the people of Baltimore, I'm gonna say some stuff to you now. You're not gonna like it, but you're gonna have to hear it. No one would dispute it's the greatest time in history to be living in the greatest country in the world. We enjoyed more leisure and comfort than anyone else. But it was not some stroke of fortune that made our free state the shining example it is today. It was hard work, perseverance, and determination. And though it may seem like our parents' generation have already cornered the market on progress, winning the war on crime, the war on drugs, and the war on terror, is there any other way to truly show these heroes the honor they deserve except for reaching even further and pushing ourselves even harder than anyone in human history has ever pushed themselves before? How you ask, I'll tell you. Who among us can say that they have never once, while watching a movie or a show, encountered an irritatingly tedious sequence or scene? Should a nation of our caliber, whose films and shows are watched all over the world, be releasing this kind of content? Is the most advanced culture in the world today truly incapable of producing a feature film or prestige comedy purged of all imperfection? No! I believe no! If there can be one Citizen Kane's, there can be all Citizen Kane's. You get a Citizen Kane. You get a Citizen Kane. You get a Citizen On the roof of the club, netbook and lap, she looks just like any other early adopter shooting snoods or scrolling their friends through feed. But in the data corridors of the municipal hardnet, Tanya comes down like a wolf on the freaking fold. Backslash knuckle crack. <laughs> now the real work begins. Of course, in a city prosperous enough to afford AAA force prevention from Adasu International, even a phenom like Tanya has to pull out all the stops to make it past the four alarm firewalls in the financial sector. So she's too engrossed to notice when the door swings open behind her, and one of the crusties from the alley steps gingerly onto the roof, joined forthwith by his two compatriots, now bearing a shoulder-mounted video camera and boom mic, respectively. As Tanya battles counter-intrusion subroutines, the Oogles are able to take a light read and set up the shot without much inconvenience. Once ready, the underlings each flash the leader a sign. Got it. Uh -huh. And he makes a few swipes on his smartwatch. Almost immediately, there's a feeble clunk from behind the access door. Ow, what the F? You're shitting me. The lead hobo, known to his friends as Marx, shakes his head in exasperation. It's open. If you're thinking that there's no way Tanya could still be oblivious to all the action on the roof behind her, you're absolutely right. After that third failed attempt to breach the door, Tanya turns and sees three people she did not expect to see, here or anywhere, made even more incongruous by their professional grade multimedia equipment. While the hacker tries to account for this new data, uh... Marx tickles the peripheral on his wrist causing a one-eyed flying fortress to rise from its hiding place at the far end of the roof. Mike Kwan, a remote-operated rotocraft of Mark's own custom design, has a dozen propellers arranged in pairs around a hexagonal moldavite platform. Hanging suspended in a cage at the center is a four-chip video camera with pure germanium semiconductors and gyro-stabilized gimbals to ensure smooth, clear video even during high-speed pursuits. This door is the worst. Why is it even here? It's not locked. 
abandoning all attempts to decipher what exactly is happening around her. Tanya rips the smart mask from her face and quickly shoves her laptop back into her tactical satchel. Oil. I hate this dog. It's not locked. And with a swift kick, Ariel 12 separates the metal access door from its hinges and sends it flying like a disc golf disc across and over the side of the roof. Whoa! Close one! Just barely not decapitating the agile oogle diligently filming its flight. I'm okay. Iridescent smoke pours from the mutilated passageway until a second hydraulic horse kick scatters the smoke cloud in a dozen directions and reveals the most advanced unmanned enforcement system ever designed by humankind. 520 pounds of correction and rehabilitation in a 4 foot 10 high specific strength steel frame. I don't see any door, Gev. By this time, Tanya is crawling around the edge of the roof, searching frantically for some way to get down without breaking one or more legs. An unhurried Oriole, her own deadly appendage still aloft, releases a 4,000 lumen beam from her mouth and sweeps the entire rooftop and a few rooftops nearby, crowding her vision with animated graphs and inscrutable oscilloscopes. Target lock acquired. Target apprehension assured. The camera-wielding lackey scurries in for a close-up shot, and, with a pair of complimentary gestures, Mark sends Maekwon and his boom mic off in the other direction, towards the distressed fugitive contemplating the drop down to Landvale Street. Meanwhile, Oriole's deputy celebrity sidekick, Gevra, is still in the stairwell, trying to inspect the toe of her shoe without taking it off. Guys. Guys. Guys, guys, hold on for a sec, maybe. Tonight, she's wearing a really beautiful red wool dress coat, unzipped to just below the belly button, exposing most of a chartreuse smesh bodice and matching garter set. And of course, she's never seen without her trademark affectation, an unpaired fashion glove. Tonight's is a crimson Italian kidskin and wool mousquetaire lined with cashmere and accented around the wrist with a ring of ruthenium studs. Guys, cut. Cut. Guys, really, I think I messed up one of my heels. Tanya stares over the edge of the roof to the puke-streaked street below, now deserted, all the potential witnesses locked safely inside the arts hub or long since fled. Okay, okay. Behind her, the heavy tread of the cybernetic detective and the satellite patter of its camera crew draw closer with a strangely disconcerting lack of urgency. The flying neurochemical fear bones. Let's just take five, guys. I'm going to get some more shoes from the cow. Fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? Tanya hears nothing now, save the sound of her own heart trying to force its way off of this doomed flight. She closes her eyes and puts one foot to the very edge of the roof. Each adrenaline-laced bead of sweat, each clench and crease of desperation straining her face, every rippling tremor in her voluminous nostrils is detailed in breathtaking high resolution by the 10, count them 10 cameras mounted on Mark's other mechanical marvel, the tail-sitting VTOL known as Macton. This many-eyed aerodyne rises with a whir of its modest twin prop rotors, capturing the unpromising altitude confronting the fleeing felon in full 360 degrees. The sound of Macton's motors make Tanya open her eyes. She sees something like a fused quartz milio battleform floating in the air between her and the ground, and her fear falls away. She throws up both arms and leaps from the edge. And as she drops, Tanya locks eyes with one of Macton's 56 megapixel image sensors and hurls her utility satchel at the hovering beholder, hooking a strap on one of Macton's stiff wings. There's a violent jerk before the emergency stabilization measures engage and compensate for the dangling hacker's added weight. Once engaged and compensated, however, a small compartment opens to eject a shower of neon orange marking particles into Tanya's hair and face forcing her to let go of the satchel and drop the rest of the way to the ground. Man versus technology? Heh. Not in this lifetime. 
Marx makes Mai Quan maneuver to get a good shot of Tanya as she raises herself from the pavement to flip off the trio of production crusties on the roof above. <laughs> Sorry, suits, show's over. What? Gev, as it happens, also has a good view of this flip off in the rear view mirror of her DS21. Well, our mom's DS21, but mom's never gonna ask for it back. No comments on my chartreuse, mesh bodice, and matching gaudo set? What show are these rubes even watching? Anyway, Gev, who's been in the driver's seat scrolling social media on her smartwatch, squeals upon seeing the hacker stagger to her feet. Oh, 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 oh! Then she starts the engine and throws it into reverse, using the whole car to prevent the perpetrator's escape. <laughs> like in it! <laughs> Threat permanently de-escalated by Adasu Altimore at all 24, 33 hours. The ever-stoic Oriole launches off the roof, and the cement splinters as she lands beside the crumpled body of her prey. You were right about one thing, tough stuff. The show is over. But on the next episode, I get to cancel your ass. Live. You literally can't miss it. Only on 360 Network. Beauty and the Box! I'm not the first person to welcome you to Altimore. But if so, I wouldn't take it personally. Most everybody here is super busy. Our timeline might seem like a paradise compared to yours, but it still takes a lot of hard work and long nights if you want to achieve your goals and realize your greatest aspirations. I will admit though, the perks here are pretty darn cool. I mean, it's not like everything is better. We don't have celebrity chefs for one, but we do have celebrity detectives and we had a perfect president not that long ago and nobody has to lock up their bikes when they go out to the shop and they started making drones shaped like people. Oh, and online. Our way of going online is really cool. We don't just have one internet, we have a bunch. So you can choose the online experience that fits your lifestyle and budget. And nowadays, all of them are Claudia smart mask compatible. So we're not just online, we're in line, virtually. You know what? I'll just show you. Put on this mask. Something happened online yesterday that might help you understand exactly how things work around here. We're gonna take the information superhighway to a seedy little node called the Wigwam where, not even 24 hours ago, an amateur whistleblower, dressed like my sister, delivered a secret file to a secret cabal of cyber-terrorists. Well, she's not dressed exactly like my sister, but maybe like how my sister would dress if she were making fun of herself? She's got on a blue and white sailor suit, like a duck wears, tailored to show midriff, and a single burgundy boxing glove on her left hand. The Wigwam is a red light dive bar with an old-timey playlist and pre-digital cash registers. And tonight, it's packed so full of chubby hooded cultists that the nervous newcomer has to push her way to the back of the room. Excuse you. There's a long wooden table back there 
behind which sit three very important hacktivist leaders. One wears the form of a five-foot-tall rat with shockingly buff arms and several additional elbows. Beside the rat is a gritty take on Frankenstein's monster. The other guy at the table is the bassist from the Sex Pistols. When the interloper with the ill-advised avatar pushes her way right up to that table, they all turn to appraise the brazen stranger. Have you brought us what you promised? Yeah, no, it's right here. Uh, that lame-ass av is bad enough. You have to do a lame-ass catchphrases too. The voice comes with it. You paid money for an av of Gevra von Marburg. I'm just trying to cover my ass, okay? Who's gonna waste time trace routing a Gev stan? Then the false Gevra pulls a big block of cheese out of thin air and plops it on the wooden table. You have a point. The real Gev's not as hot as that avatar, though, is she? The only people that think the real Gev's hot are people who haven't seen a sex tape. Again, just an avatar, not the real Gev. But you know, go off king. And also, for whatever reason, the sign is on the city's hard net. Safe to use that pass key on site. Of course! No shit, Sherlock. Quiet. Quiet. You have done well. For a bloody noob. If this works, your gift to the pale cow will not be forgotten. But anyways, right now, outside the large intestine, Adasu Altimore's investigative division is preparing to return control of the crime scene back to the venue's staff. A now normal amount of clean marks, who couldn't change out of his crust punk disguise fast enough, supervises his faithful interns as they load up the division's Higer V series with their costumes and cables and paper mache pitbull. Ariel is helping to lift an immobilized Tanya Hardcore into the back of an ambulance. <laughs> Gevra, already inside, is taking a wet nap to the remainder of the anti-face recognition makeup on the captured hacktivist's face. Okay, uh, you have the right to remain silent. Everything you say can and will- Can you move your legs? I can't feel my legs. No, anything you say can and will be used against you at your trial, you have- Hey, Lady Terminator out there already said all this. Oh, you have the right to an affordable attorney. I said the cyborg bitch did this already. It was filmed. Please shut up. Yeah, no, but I have to do it too. What does it mean that I can't feel my legs? Shh. <laughs> attorney. I guess that was all of it. You understand all the rights, right? Tough stuff. All right, gang, you did good tonight. Go get some rest. We're gonna have a trial tomorrow. Are we still meeting at 11 again? Noon is a lot more realistic for me tomorrow, actually. No sweat. Noon's fine. But if you stop for coffees on the way, get me one of those s'mores lattes, yeah? Absolutely. See you in the morning, Sarge. 1.8 miles south of the large intestine, at the corner of Lombard and Green, is a building called Davidge Hall. Aside from its vintage brick walls and circular dome, Davidge is an otherwise unassuming part of the sprawling campus of the Maryland College of Medicine. In truth, though, this is the oldest building continuously used for medical education in the entire Western Hemisphere. So it's a place with a rich history. The events unfolding here now, however, in the dim hour before another glorious dawn, do not bode well for the future. Hey Cher, got another one for Full Viv already? I wish. This one's for Her Highness. Oh my god. Jocelyn Peters, hair still damp from a shower in the third year's locker room, is on her way out of the building when she encounters her friend Sharon pushing a gurney towards the anatomical amphitheater. That's gotta be what, her third? Fourth? Yeah. Ugh, I wish they'd just give her whatever degree her grandma paid for so we could get on with our lives. Would a degree really be enough? Wouldn't she need like a tutu or tiara to go with it? Funny you should say that. Come here. Look at this. <laughs> oh my god. You did not. Sharon flips back a corner of the sheet, covering the now sedated vivisection subject. And together, the two friends share a chuckle. 
<laughs> Today, Americans have more options than ever. You get to decide how you want to get to work, how you want to pay your bills, even how you want to vote. But it's not just the American people. American cities have more choices to make, too. And while there are many companies offering protective security and managed support services for the modern metropolis, only one of them has received Urbanite Magazine's highest rating in both categories, five years running. Adasu International is known throughout the circuit as a leading provider of quality-driven force prevention services, recognized for our flawless execution of multifaceted security programs. Whether your city is already a thriving part of the U.S. economy's renaissance or an emerging market eager to get in on the action, Adasu's fully integrated safety solutions are guaranteed to mitigate risk in accordance with local, international, and human rights laws without ever compromising effectiveness or efficiency. Adasu International. We don't just secure your city. We secure your trust. Once a month, they close down the streets around the Washington Monument for the Friday Free Flower Market. And if you're visiting Altimore for the first time, you really shouldn't miss it. You can see the Z-Rabbers, who used to be some kind of unregulated produce consortium, take their horse-drawn dust separators right up the middle of Forest Street. With all the old buildings still standing in this part of town, you'd almost think you'd travel back in time. Except I guess everything back then would have been a whole lot dirtier. The Adasu Altimore HQ is three blocks north of the monument, at the northern edge of the historic Mount Vernon Empowerment Zone. The building itself, built in 1892, is a gorgeous Romanesque in the style of Henry Hobson with generous applications of the same Altimore County marble used for the other Washington Monument, the one in the district. You know, I never understood why the Washington Monument down there is even called the Washington Monument. I mean, our Washington Monument actually shows the guy, Washington, the cherry chopper himself, our indentulous father, who could throw a whole dollar over the Potomac but couldn't deceive to save his life. He's right up there, in the middle of our Mount Vernon. Turning in his resignation papers, powdered wig and all. But the 555 foot monument in the district is just like a blank stone tower with blinking red eyes. What's George Washington about that? Anyway, the point is, Adasu Altimore headquarters is one of the most beautiful places to work in all of Midtown. And right now, Major Inspector Vendergood, head of the Special Investigations Section, Hey, how you doing? is arriving at work in his customary fashion through the loading docks, where the evidence boys are taking the shrink wrap off today's towering pallet of crates marked evidence. You're gonna get buff lifting all those crates, boys. Lifting these nuts. Yeah, baby, lifting these nuts. The back way is as it happens, the quickest way to get from the outside of the building to Vendergood's office on the second floor. Today, Vendergood nearly manages to make it from the loading dock to the stairs without encountering any brutes, striding briskly past the observation suites, partially obscured by reflections of animated statistics, only to bump right into Lieutenant Commander Barrington. The analytics from last night. Barrington gives the Major a shiny black folder, blind embossed with Adasu's majestic crest. A nine-foot barbed wire crown of Aramosa vein cut on a field of gleaming red Verona embers. Not a very riveting read. Risk index as ever holding steady a couple decimals north of nada. You dicks aren't running out of things to do up there, are you? Now Vendergood, you should know, has a comically long body, at least a foot longer than that of the Rattler Compact Barrington. Although they probably weigh about the same. Hey, those couple of decimals might not seem like much on paper, but they represent the ipso facto most twisted citizens Vendergood, in good all- relax. I'm just busting your chops. Suddenly, the ever-vigilant lieutenant commander spots a hulking form in the main hallway moving towards them. Well, I've got lieutenants to command, so I'll leave you to it, Major. Before moving on, 
Vendergood spends a few seconds searching for an appropriate place to unburden himself of the new folder. This delay, despite its relative brevity, spoils any chance there may have been to evade the huge hairless man now closing the distance between them. Major Inspector! Major Inspector! Major Inspector! Oh, great. The super fan. The glabrous giant sports a homemade approximation of the neon real tree dry suits worn by Barrington and the Brutes. Its hand sewn nature is evident throughout, but it is complete and faithful in nearly every detail, aside from a tomato sauce stain or two on the lapel. My good major, take not this my boldness in approaching you as indication of some failure to apprehend the demands of your office. As such, I'll proceed directly to the purpose of my call. Wednesday past, I spoke to the Lieutenant Commander regarding a disused service cap of the kind worn by the ancillaries of the Operational Intelligence Division. For I have reason to believe such a hat does in fact exist somewhere in this most noble edifice. And I believe as well that, if your organization would be so generous as to allow me temporary possession of such service cap, it would greatly benefit my modest efforts at augmenting your distinguished outfit's store of data regarding imminent activities inclining toward the transgression of the law. You know, big guy, I want you to have that hat. I want to see that hat in your hands, but... I still got the same problem. Where is the hat? I don't know. I, I don't think I would know if I even saw the hat because I've actually never seen this hat. You might consider taking it up with the evidence boys. And with that, Vendergood, who seems but a slender, normal length man besides the humongous hat seeker, sprints away, rifling his blazer's many pockets for the ID fob that grants access to the south stairwell. Unfortunately, before he even has a chance to catch his breath on the other side of that door, he hears Lieutenants Pyro and Milagro coming up from the squash courts on B-Level. And I was like, whoa, 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 and you were like, bam, boom, bam, and I was like, and I was like, and you were like, whoa. and I was about to be like, what up? And I was about to like, whoa, whoa, whoa. you were totally like, what down, and you were like, whoa, whoa. but Fendergood attains the second floor without further incident. The main hallway up here doubles as a shared office space for the representation unit. The senior reps have personal cubicles near the stairway, inside of what must have been wooden phone booths from back in the rotary phone days. The desk pushed in the corner, the one the other lawyers take turns with, was rescued from the loading dock after it was deemed unusable by a previous head of special investigations. The only decorative element in the lawyer's hallway is a 15-year-old poster from Madeleine Carlo's election campaign, emblazoned with the ubiquitous, iconic image of the president before she was president, carrying an unconscious teenage girl out of the rubble at Ground Zero. Both senior members of the Adasu Altimore's Affordable Council outfit are in today, watching their wired tablets with the usual mix of disappointment and resignation. Much too involved in the intricacies of their work to pay the major any mind. Vendergood flashes his fob again at the north end of the hall, and the gate to Dick's side proper opens with a salutary exhalation. Everything beyond this point is technically the major's domain. As good as things had been back when he was working cases, he'd never once pictured himself in charge of the whole darn studio. And what a studio. Without a doubt, the birthplace of the modern detective. It's an enormous responsibility, one that might put a lesser man to flight. But Vendergood has thus far managed to hold his ground with a three-pronged approach. First, he's declared the entire second floor off-limits to the building's custodial staff, freeing up resources for the major to direct to more lasting efforts at beautifying the space. Witness the centerpiece of the Dick side reception area, a genuine Bernard Gatton water cooler. Allegedly, with proper training, you can tell the exact time from the inscrutable tangle of glass tubes running through the tank. The second prong of Vendergood's managerial trident is the courage to delegate. It might even be said that Vendergood has a superhuman capacity for delegation. Some bosses, they don't even want to delegate. They fear the car will veer off the road the moment someone else's hands touch the wheel. 
Major, inasmuch as he could be said to be cognizant of the wheel, felt it ought be equally off limits to all, regardless of rank. The secret to delegation, of course, is to have good, smart people to whom you can delegate. Ideally, they'd be even smarter than you. The Major had, for the most part, succeeded in hiring such people. Sergeant Marks, for instance. Sergeant Marks may be most of all. Today, as he usually does, Vedergood comes upon the sergeant already at his workstation, reviewing footage from the night before. Top of the morning to you, Marks. I heard we might be having a trial today. Vendergood, look at this. Marks indicates some green and grainy footage from a hidden camera in the stairwell of the large intestine. In it, the two interns, Ricky and Ronica, are seen dropping the unpowered Macton down the roof access stairs. By increasing the playback speed, Mark deftly transforms the intern's frantic recovery into a comic vignette. Look at their faces. Oh man, that's gonna be a good gift. That is the sound of my sister, searching for a mug in one of Mark's file cabinets. Gev, yeah, check this out. Oh. Do you think she saw them? No way. Why would she go on and hack the sign if she saw us? Dunno. Some people really want to be famous. How's it hanging, Gev? To her great relief, Gevra finally finds the mug she's put in the file cabinet. I actually really need to go put water in this cup right now. Excellent. I'll come with you. Feeling good about the trial today? Yeah, no, I feel that I'm, like, not present, actually. Distracted, you mean? Yeah, no, but it's stupid. Stupid things can still be important. So... Do you watch seasoning? Oh, not really. No, I, I don't have time to watch much fiction lately. At the water cooler, Fendergut plucks a paper cone from the plastic dispenser, fills it with water, and consumes it with a single swallow. He makes it look quite effortless. Gevra, on the other hand, seems to require total concentration in order to get as much water into the mug as she gets on the floor. So there's like this abusive cook, right? Who just gives everybody shit all the time, but I guess he's so good at cooking that everybody just takes it? I see. Uh, this is seasonings now. Yeah, no, so this season he kidnapped this girl and our mom is like freaking out because this dude totally sucks and is moody and aggro, but it turns out this girl loves the food he makes so much that she's kind of into it, but he still sucks. But the food is like hands down the best she's ever had. So last night her mom did all this stuff and looked like she's going to get the girl back from the for half the year. Well, it's a cliffhanger. Your show there has pilfered a very ancient plotline. Just watch. If she ate the pomegranate, she partially belongs to the realm of the dead and can only return to her mother for half the year, after which she must descend back to the underworld once more. Ancient Italians taught the kids that that's why we have winter. Vandergrid helpfully takes Gavra's cup, fills it with water, and returns it. The thing is, though, Gev, I got another email from the regional director. This thing about the billboard, some kind of LED billboard, not really a vanished person's case, is it? Not even a vanished billboard. Still right where it always was. Don't be too sure about that, Major. The pop we brought in, she might know somebody who vanished. That is one way of looking at it. Uh, it's just that you gotta keep in mind there are only so many cases to go around. That's why every detective has their own beat. Garcia's on vandalism, Molyneux out in Oakland's got arson, and that lady in Lisbon, the one that does jailbreaks, what's her name? Gevra knows her name, but chooses to focus on her original plan of drinking some water. You like the desail? We're getting the good stuff now that they've officially joined the board. If I'm not mistaken, this batch is from the Chagos Archipelago, just east of Madagascar. This news about the archipelago seems to pique Gevra's attention. She makes eye contact with Vendergood for the first time in days. Then, with the blankest possible expression, she parts her teeth and returns an entire mouthful of water back into the mug from whence it came. <coughs> and my sister takes her leave, carrying the wet mug across the studio to her favorite room in the whole building, an 8x10 soundproof holding cell. It has an official name, of course, but everybody in the office calls it the box. Gevra jangles her keychain at the sensor until the door gives way. Inside the box, of course, is Tanya Hardcore. What do you want? And she's still wearing her motorcycle jacket. Though so now, it's over the top of an orange prison jumpsuit. She's restrained on a hydraulic operating table, tilted to its extreme upright position. And both her legs are in casts. Brought you some water. We didn't 
get a chance to see the inside of the actual surgical theater last time we were in Davidge Hall, did we? That's a shame, because now it's absolutely trashed. I don't even want to think of how many millions of dollars worth of state-of-the-art medical equipment is in pieces all over the floor. And the hemophiliac splatter across the walls is bad enough. But whoever actually has to clean the guts and lungs off the suede upholstery on the whole first row of seats is going to be really bummed. Chanyeol, are you there, baby? This is Gravity Rosina calling you. Yeah, hi, yeah. This is, uh... It's, uh, Genyeol, actually, but wow. Hi. Well, I just couldn't wait to talk to you face to face. I've been following your work for a long time and we're just ecstatic that the best writer in Baltimore is finally going to be working with us. A long time? Really? Yes. Ever since that article about those two poor old men at the assisted living facility. What an awful thing that woman did. Garden doves. Yeah, it was fuck- it, it was pretty horrific. Oh, can you imagine what would have happened to those poor elders if you hadn't been able to show everyone what a monster that owner was? But we don't need to talk about her anymore. This is your special day. I know you're still filling out all the paperwork, honey, but as soon as you do, you'll be getting a package from us with your advance and some goodies I put in to help you celebrate. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but the check is a little bit more than what they probably told you to expect. I thought you deserved to be rewarded for all the hard work you've already been doing. Wow, that's... I, I don't know what to say. Th thank you? I know it's not the easiest time right now for writers. But who is this bundle of joy in your lap? What is your name, you precious lump of love? This is Meryl. What a pretty name for a pretty girl. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is what it seems. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is what it seems. Life is what it seems. The Didymo Stigmergic Mandroid 10 Mark 9, like the DSM-10 models used in other cities, walked with its head forward and fists clenched. But our iteration is the only one to have adopted the habit of keeping those fists thrust in the muff of a hooded sweatshirt. 10 Mark 9 always wears a hoodie and mustache and mirror shades while traveling outside. Oh God! An ensemble that measurably dampens the unpleasant visceral reaction the machine Ooh. often provokes in the unacquainted. What do you see that I do? At close proximity though, oh. even the most stylish hypergraphic hoodie is incapable of completely quelling the reflexive Ooh. repulsion. Oh. oh my God. The faces that slide across the machine's aviators grow in size, discomfort, and disapproval at equal rates. Oh. Turn away, Jimmy. Don't look. Now, I wish I could say the 10 Mark 9's poor reputation is entirely unjustified, but it's not. Not entirely. Even so, considered objectively, it's still a remarkable piece of technology. And as far as ambulatory computers go, pretty much unsurpassed in human history. Until last year. Do you see Mario 
last night. Oh, I'm ready for awesome. Whenever anomalous phenomena arises, as it inevitably will, the DSM-10 is able to project several trillion hypothetical outcomes, indexed by probability and supplemented by any and all relevant data found not only on the global information superhighway, but also on a proprietary helicordinal database where all of the Didymost Digmergic Mandroids deployed nationwide upload continuous streams of high-resolution video and time-stamped archives of the attendant calculations. And it normally completes this entire process at speeds as high as 500 miles per hour, almost two times as fast as an alpha motor neuron moving along the human spinal cord. They still think you're helping them, huh? If they suspected otherwise, I much doubt I could continue to come and go as I please. So like now, when the 10 Mark 9 detects an anomaly, it pivots instantaneously, making a hard right turn into a small crowd of hot dog enthusiasts <sighs> vying for the attention of the dog merchant. I'm gonna get a Polish dog this time. Nobody may have noticed, or much cared even if they had, but with this small evasion, the machine not only eluded detection by the potential threat, it also camouflaged its close-range repulsion field with a low-level hostility already extant in the queue of hungry hot dog lovers. Hey buddy, what's your order? Come on pal, there's a line of people waiting. I have no response for that. And with that, the 10 Mark 9 pivots again and returns to its previous objective, getting inside the Adasu Altimore HQ. And now, let's return to the Beauty and the Bot in Terracast already in progress. State your name. Lawyer. State your full name as it appears on legal documents. Lawyer. You are Marty Hardcore. What? And you are not leaving this room until I unlock the truth. And you should already have a pretty good idea of how I deal with stubborn locks, right Marty? Drag and drop to add this gift to your quick slot. I said lawyer, dickweeds. I'm not a dickweed. I'm a Venus flygirl. Let me talk to a lawyer. Grimacing with disgust, Ariel steps forward and swivels a mounted tablet in front of the suspect's face. Select your representative. Representation. Prince of the Hammer, Corinthian College. Nailed for cybercrime, eh? Sounds like it's time to bring down the hammer. Sheila Gardner, to Rye University. This arrest has random virtue testing written all over it. It's got more weak points than my kids' ballet class, if you know how to find them. Kim Tabara, Phil and Julie. I may look friendly, but in the courtroom, I'm a combination of friendly and ruthless. Adasu representation. Oh, God, I don't know the first one. It seems Princeton Hammer will be the attorney for the accused this evening. Hammer's last encounter with Judge Weege did not go well, so he's going to be looking to regain some much-needed respect here tonight. And Ariel has started the clock. As per standard interrogation regulations, the defendant will now confer with her counsel. Uh, it started already? Uh, okay, okay, everything she says is a trick. Oh my god. I can't hear what you're saying. The audio feed is one way, so just listen. The more open-ended the question, the more concise your answer has to be. Don't elaborate on anything. They probably don't have any evidence, right? Say, I wish to assert my privilege against self-incrimination to anything that feels tricky. Don't inadvertently acknowledge any attempt to characterize your intentions. And try to ration your concessions. And don't correct anything she gets wrong. So try to get... Quite a lot to chew on for the young defendant, a first-time offender. Let's hope she's ready to tap gloves with the next generation of law enforcement. I really enjoyed our little race earlier tonight, Marty. Now, let's see if your human mind is any faster than your human body. Oh, snap! snap. snap. Guess who can't wait to rumble? The bionic badass from Baltimore, Ariel 12. And possibly her intrepid companion, Gev. <sighs> the loyal pout takes so long. Before the Intericast continues, we've got time for a random check-in with one of our 360 Networks Premium Subscribers. Dudes! Dudes, it's us! Oh yeah, you know we're watching the bot! <laughs> it's perfect about to get a broken wheel to go with those broken legs! Oh, 
that girl though? And what happened with that cow call? Oh, she works for that cult, obviously. She's about to get worked out, all right? She's fucking with your digital inquisitor. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you upgrade to a premium membership right now, your household will be eligible for a random check-in during tonight's trial. Click on the blinking cog at the top of the screen to go to your 360 Networks membership settings page. If you're already a premium subscriber, just answer any one of the survey questions below to continue. Downstairs, in the Operational Intelligence Section Security Operations Center, Lieutenant Commander Barrington and Milagro, his top lieutenant, observed the city from their dual sit stand consoles. Switch to Sector 775. Hmm. Expand Quadrant 314. What's that in the bottom drawer there? Let's see that in Thermo. Hmm. Looks like another wireless back massager. A real fancy one, too, by the look of it. Back massager. I wouldn't bet on it, Lieutenant. Commander. An expensive back massager underneath all that other junk in the bottom drawer. Commander, you think it's a weapon? No, Lieutenant, not a weapon. That's a... It's a nympho thing. Really? Nymphos? Mean a nice apartment like that? You give people too much credit, Milagro. Put a minimum priority flag down and we'll go on to Sector 776. It's the Metro Crime Stoppers Anonymous Tip Point, Commander! And the caller's using one of our Smallio Corp single-use smartwatches with voice and video masking! Put it on the big screen. Name and location, please, sir. Hello! Is this the police? Name and location, please, sir. I want to report a crime! A crime? Are you sure? I... I think that there's been an... abduction... at the medical school! Go ahead and decrypt, Lieutenant. Excuse me? Sir, please stay calm. Have you considered that we might already know about this? Now take a deep breath and tell us what you know. Her name is Demi, and I'm worried. I'm worried that no one will help her! At that moment, a hoodied figure slides unnoticed behind the occupied officers. The culmination of an exquisite ballet of coincidences, complete with copious tiptoe, has thus far permitted it to move through HQ entirely unmolested. Upon reaching the south stairs, the security doors part of their own accord, and the figure disappears into the stairwell where he encounters Lieutenants Pyro, Yoni, and Shaky on their way back from the barbershop on B-Level. D, stop walking. Yoni, did you put the shades on him? Yoni removes the aviators, revealing the DSM-10 Mark IX's equally reflective eyes, which are presently set off by a generous application of Chroma Precision Eyeliner in Midnight Black. Oh man, the glasses make the makeup even funnier. I wish I came up with that. Hey Dees, if I had nuts on the wall, would they be walnuts? <laughs> <laughs> I have no response for that. Lieutenant Shaky snatches the sunglasses from Yoni's hands, so he can slip them on and approximate Deez's stiff posture. Spare a response. Please, sir, spare a response. <laughs> <laughs> the laughing lieutenants head back to their dual-sit stand consoles in the operational intelligence section. Once the stairwell is empty, the 10 Mark 9 walks the rest of the way to Major Vendergood's office. <laughs> Finding it vacant, the ever stoic machine approaches the bay window facing west out onto Forest Street and sits there with its back against the glass, staring in silence at the opposite wall. Our Washington Monument actually shows the guy, Washington, the cherry chopper himself, our indentulous father. 